folks. Welcome back. This is Andy with the Poor Proles Almanac. This isn't a prologue? This is not a prologue. All right. This one is not the log. This is the Mac. The Almanac. <laughs> the mac and mac I can't. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, you can find us on Patreon if you're enjoying what we're doing here and you'd like to help us cover the costs. We don't explicitly offer any of our traditional content focused on the specific goals of this podcast to our Patreons in terms of limited access or anything like that right now. Knowledge is for everyone, but we have started up a Patreon-only miniseries called The Prologues, during which we'll do some critiques on various subject matters and talk about those things not only from an intersectional lens, but also within the context of this podcast, Societal Collapse and Reconstruction. If you're interested and you are willing to donate $2, it's up on our Patreon. We've also released one episode that was asked by popular demand for public consumption, so that's a good place to check it out and see if you'd like to hear more. On top of this content, we've got stickers available, and we're including some footage from my farm to put the theory we're talking about into practice. So if you want to see what's going on over there, check out the Patreon. Yeah, he's got Icelandic sheeps and ducks and shit. It's cool. And turkeys. Turkeys. And chickens. I haven't seen the turkey. Wait. Last year you were chasing turkeys, but those were wild turkeys. Those were feral turkeys. Now yes. you have turkeys. Now I have my own turkeys that so you're not chasing away. These ones are being trained for battle against the feral turkeys. Battle turkeys, dude. Battle turkeys. Let's go. Additionally, if you don't want to use Patreon, but you do want to support what we're doing, we do have a Venmo as well. If you go on our Instagram, we have the uh, QR code or whatever it is that you can use to donate some money. You can treat it like a tip jar, essentially, to give us some support without feeling like you have to give a monthly donation or maybe you're just happy with one particular episode and you just want to say thanks we're also on instagram like i said and facebook if you want to follow us over there and if this is your first episode we highly recommend going back to the first episode of the podcast and catching up since each episode springboards from the previous content or at least the beginning of the mini series which helps frame up these conversations this mini series is a little bit different than the ones we've done in the past With this series, we're focusing on interviewing various people that are either building dual power systems to deal with what comes after this collapse, or they're really doing something that ties into what we imagine the world will need in the future. Today, we have a special guest, Nathan Kleinman, the co-founder of the Experimental Farm Network, a nonprofit focused on food justice and climate change. He is a member of the Seed Advisory Committee of the Non-GMO Project, the Education Committee of the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Jersey, and Vice President of GMO Free Pennsylvania. As a plant breeder and researcher, Nate has a broad range of interests, but he is most engaged at the moment in the pursuit of climate-stabilizing perennial staple crops. Talking with Nate on the podcast has been really interesting, and he talks a bit about diving into this idea of making breeding of plants and creating plants that are built for local climates, something that can be accessible to common people. You don't have to be some botanist or somebody with a background in plants or anything like that, as long as you're willing to do the work. And the main goal of the project seems to be around this idea of giving people the authority to decide on what plants should be in their environment by looking to the past and what plants have existed in those environments. So I think it allows us to start having these conversations of what food systems can look like outside of the way we do things today. The state of mind you have to be in for this conversation that we had with Nate is that I guess it's two worlds colliding where it's the kind of the buy local um, aspect of relocalizing food systems and also the future of those food systems. They're not in hands of corporations or businesses, but also in the hands of those who are growing local food. It's a, a comprehensive understanding of food and where it comes from and our place within that food system. And also its future. I and think that's future, that's yeah. what it point that's what this conversation points to is the food we can grow now and also the future of where these crops can potentially go for us. First, thank you so much for coming on. Tell me a little bit about how you ended up getting in this very unique part of farming. Sure. Um well, it's a it's definitely a long story, but I I have been interested in growing food, growing plants since I was a real little kid, but it's not something I ever thought about as a career until uh, my experience in, in my late twenties, early thirties doing um, hurricane recovery work with Occupy Sandy. 
Um, I had been involved in the Occupy movement and after Hurricane Sandy smashed into New Jersey and New York and I was living in Philadelphia at the time in, in the Philadelphia area, I, I realized that this is uh, climate change is, is going to be the single most important issue of my lifetime. And after doing that work for a year, I, I realized I could probably spend the rest of my life bouncing from disaster to disaster doing relief work or I can try and do something to get to the root of the problem. And um, I happened to go to a talk by a guy named Eric Tonsmeyer in the summer of 2013 about perennial industrial crops and uh, carbon sequestration. And I realized that we've got a lot of work to do um, changing our agricultural system to become a weapon against climate change rather than a driver of it. That was what made me decide to start the Experimental Farm Network. But i had been interested in seeds for a long time and collecting seeds for, for a few years before that, uh, saving seed. And so these two things sort of mesh together. And that's, uh, that's really how, how my life in this work started. So did you have any background in botany or um, any, I guess, technical education before you got into this? No. Um, self-taught, taught by many mentors and friends along the way. Uh, I studied foreign policy at Georgetown for college. Awesome. <laughs> Definitely going to work. So our project here has been really focused on this idea of community empowerment, in particular around this idea of sustainable uh, systems that we can apply. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about that because I think that's uh, a main driver for what you're doing. I'm always curious what that really looks like in practice. And I think there's a lot of people that will always agree that community empowerment and self-determination are great things, but actually translating that into something that actually works and is I don't want to say self-replicating, but um, like once people buy in, they continue wanting to be a part of it. As a farmer, I tend to think about things like what you're doing as being really intimidating, even though I grew up around it. So like selective breeding, while it might seem very simple at first, it's not when you're actually doing it, as I'm sure you know. So I am curious about specifically the perennial sorghum project you've got going on. How do you get people to feel confidence in getting involved in these types of projects where it seems like they're handling something that might be like a rare seed or that they might mess up? That's a that's a great question. I, I try to tell people that seeds are here in abundance. We we have lots of them. If somebody really doesn't trust themselves with something very, very scarce, you know, I, I'll I'll take those concerns. But for something like a, a breeding project like that sorghum, we've got plenty of seeds. If somebody fails, they fail. But if, uh, if they don't try, then they're never going to succeed. So I, I tell people that farmers have been breeding plants for 10,000 years. The, we wouldn't have agriculture if it wasn't for illiterate farmers in, in uh, pre-literate societies uh, who were growing the plants that did well for them, growing the plants that they liked, the plants that tasted good, the plants that the animals didn't want, um, the plants that survived the droughts and the rains and that's how agriculture was born. That's how every vegetable that we eat was born. Um, so it's, you know, th this is something that I, I, I definitely understand that a lot of people feel intimidated by it. There's some, there's some fear around it, but it's only in the last hundred years that this has been become a professionalized career that people go to school for plant breeding degrees until then nobody needed it. And I would, I would say that in a lot of ways, our agricultural system was a lot more resilient uh, before all those professionals got involved. Yeah. So I'm curious personally, as somebody that's obsessed with the idea of perennial plants, kind of what your vision is in terms of like these perennial cereals and grains and things like that, that you're working on. So I think that perennials are the future of agriculture. Farmers who, who grow perennials generally have to work a lot less once they're, once they're established. The environmental impacts of perennials are, are most important and the climate impacts. Uh, every time you till the soil, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. You're destroying the, uh, the delicate web of life that lives in the soil and that is responsible for soil's capacity to sequester carbon. So we really need to get, move away from annual tillage. Um, yes, there are no-till systems and it's possible to grow annual crops in, in 
systems that do a better job of, of, uh, of keeping carbon in the soil, but perennial crops do the best job. Already, we have many crops that exist that are perennials that can be grown in sustainable ways and can be used as staple crops. Um, chestnuts and hazelnuts being two of them um, that uh, my colleague Dusty in Minnesota is, is very interested in and, and working with. But we've got to start thinking about perennial grains a lot more. And folks like the uh, at the Land Institute have been working on perennial grains for decades now and finally have something that's uh, that in, in the form of Kernza, a type of intermediate wheatgrass that they've domesticated to be a perennial grain is out there. Um, it's being commercialized. Farmers are growing it. But we need to we need to work with other crops as well, like sorghum, um, which which the Land Institute is also working on. Uh, temperate perennial oil seeds like uh, like sunflowers. There's a grain called Job's Tears, which is already uh, perennial in the tropics and um, is sort of a niche grain in this country. It's it's, it's barely grown, if at all, uh, but it's very popular in in um, Japan in particular. They call it Hatomugi. You might sometimes see that in a market in the bottom shelf of the where they're selling the sushi stuff in the in the fancy market a lot of these uh, a lot of these things are are possible and then there's there's all sorts of things that we probably haven't even thought of yet crops that have just never been domesticated because or plants that have never been domesticated because it's easier to work with annual crops that the time scale is obviously much uh, much shorter throughout the history of of farming most people have worked on domesticating these annual plants because it's just faster and easier. But, you know, you wouldn't have known starting out with, a, with um, you know, the wild progenitor of a, of a watermelon or um, a squash. These things were bitter, horrible tasting wild plants that, that it, it took some real vision to see that there could be something done with these plants. And then I'm sure that there, we, we haven't even thought of perennial plants that are out there on the landscape that could be domesticated to become food in the future. The food industry has sort of taken the complex system of nature and the way plants are evolve to suit their environment. And they've taken a scientific approach with petrochemical companies and, and seed companies and things like that. And they've basically tried to break it down into a science, like a one size fits all. And your approach is more... I guess for lack of a better word, we'll say grassroots. And it puts the power back into the people who are getting these organic seeds and growing them in different climates in order to maximize their resiliency and um, you know improve on the food itself. It, it seems like you're putting the hands back into the consumer's hands. And so how does this tie into, like say, like the buy local movement that people... Um, always encourage like buy local and buy locally grown vegetables. Can, can you still do this with this project? Are those two things um, compatible or is this more experimental? Absolutely. The, the, the corporations, the corporate approach to agriculture, which um, I have to take issue with framing it as, as being based in science, it's really based in profit. And um, they would, the, the, they use this, um, this idea that they're science-based and that it's all perfected technology, th that's really just propaganda mm -hmm. so that they convince people that their way is right. But in reality, it's not based in science. It's not based in the best science that we understand about biodiversity um, and about climate change and about resilience of, of plants and, and people. In reality, we are safer as a species if we have an immensity of crop biodiversity out on the landscape, if we have incredibly localized systems where people are growing crops that are adapted to their microclimate from seeds that were produced in that microclimate. Instead, we have these big companies that are trying to sell a one size fits all um, that actually doesn't benefit the farmers. It doesn't benefit consumers. It only benefits the corporations and their shareholders. And that's really, uh, that's, that's really the bottom line. We need to get back to a much more hyper-localized system. So part of what, what we do in, our, um, in the seeds that we sell, and EFN is, is not just a, a project of uh, conducting research, but we, have a, a, we, we fund our work through seed sales. We decided to do that 
because we didn't want to be dependent on foundations and donations in the nonprofit industrial complex. So we sell diverse breeding mixes. We sell what are called land races, which are unimproved traditional varieties associated with a particular geographic region that are incredibly diverse, resilient, uh, because that's how people all over the world are going to be able to get out of this hole that's been dug for us by these corporations, by growing their own seeds from diverse populations, selecting year after year for what does best in their area. You know, we have, our government has has hundreds of thousands of seeds in these seed banks around the country. Uh, and they're just sitting there. For the most part, the only people who take the seeds out are corporations and university researchers. But um, these are available to anyone with a legitimate research, breeding, or educational purpose. And so getting these seeds out there so that they're being adapted to this changing climate, they're not just sitting in a freezer somewhere, that's a really critical task for, uh, for a- anyone who's interested in, uh, in future resilience of, uh, of our species. Yeah, so that kind of actually plays into my next question really well, is that you know this podcast is really developed around this idea that the system that we live in really isn't sustainable. Even if you ignore the climate change component, the way we grow our food is we're just killing the soil. And I mean, you could make the case that, that is, those things are um, one in the same. And I think this idea is really overwhelming and hard for people to wrap their heads around the kind of hole that we've kind of dug ourselves into. With all this in mind between the soil issues, the lack of crop diversity and climate change, what do you think is like kind of the, the first area or uh, the primary focus in terms of what we should be doing to prepare for what's coming. You know, not to ask you a loaded question or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, I first I think you know I'm I'm by, by my nature I'm I'm an optimist. So I, I would first say that you know we need to we need to look at these issues at the soil at climate change. Um, we need to look at uh, at biodiversity in general. That the apocalypse of, of insects that we're seeing uh, all around the world as well, um, that in so many ways we know is caused by agricultural chemicals. We need to look at the health impacts of these same chemicals on, on humans as well. And these are really short-term critical things that we need to address as a society so that whatever happens in the future isn't as bad as, as it will be if we do nothing. Um, so I think the first thing we have to do is, is really focus on, on mitigating that damage, uh, whatever we can right now. And that, that's going to require really movement building, policy, significant policy changes on a national, state, and international level. But I think with respect to what do we as individuals do and what do we as, as uh, communities do to prepare for the, the things that are coming, you know, I think the pandemic has provided, um, has provided a really clear case study for for how important it is to to create community systems for resiliency to create networks of uh, of mutual aid and solidarity we need people sharing resources we need the we need the tools to do that to be av- available to people when the pandemic first landed here uh, we started I, I was thinking about, okay, how is this going to change my year here? It was, it was March and I wasn't really starting seeds yet, but I was getting ready to. And I realized, well, I usually grow seeds. I'd better grow a lot more food this year because um, I'm going to need, probably need more food. And then very quickly I realized, shoot, everybody's going to have to grow more food this year. So that was what um, jump-started the, uh, the, the main project that I've been focused on for the last um, last year, which is the Co- uh, Cooperative Gardens Commission, you know, we realized that we would not, you know, so many people don't have access to the resources they need to grow their own food. Um, and yet those resources exist in every community. And if people are practically every community or they're in one community adjacent to a community that doesn't have those resources. And so if people, um, if people will share those things, then they can feed themselves. And uh, if people learn how to can food and prepare for the winter, that, that, that can increase their, uh, increase their ability to survive a really rough winter. And uh, we recognized pretty early on that seeds was gonna be a, a, a critical hole because seed companies just didn't have the capacity 
as far as staff to deal with all the orders that were coming in. And that we started getting swamped with seed orders uh, a week into the into the uh, lockdowns. And the same started happening with seed companies uh, across the country and around the world. And seed companies started shutting down their websites and um, saying that it would be six weeks before any orders go out. And it, it was a real mess. Uh, so what we did was, because we had so many uh, friends in the seed industry, we were able to find people who were willing to donate seeds to us. Uh, and then we set about redistributing those to uh, local and regional seed hubs around the country, had people apply and started organizing conference calls and Zoom meetings. And we got free space in Philadelphia at a, at a leftist bookstore. And we just started packing packing seeds up and sending them around the country. But, you know, that in a, in a bigger crisis, you know, people might not be able to rely on some kind of centralized uh, national organization like that to do that work. So it's really, really important that people have community-based solutions, community seed libraries, community seed banks, that individuals be saving their own seeds because it's um, that, that's how we're going to feed ourselves. Yeah. I'm very curious from your perspective, you probably know a lot more about um, the the diversity of species that we don't see on the shelves better than I do. I'm kind of curious if you're, I guess, and I don't want to call it end goal, but um, in an ideal world, if our food system would look kind of like our craft beer system, where towns and communities have their local flavor almost. And I mean, you can make the case that doesn't really exist anymore with craft beer, but I think that general idea that every town has its own like three breweries uh, might speak to like every town has, you know, something that people know it for in terms of food, where collective culturally, it could almost even be a part of that community's identity, which in a lot of ways goes back to how things used to be before big beer took over the beer industry. You could say the same thing about when big agro took over the food industry, uh, this kind of return to hyper localization and that that becomes a part of that community identity. Absolutely. That Yeah, that's um, that's that's definitely something I would like to see happen again. And part of the part of the work that we do with the seed store, but also with the with the seeds that we get from the USDA is trying to get seeds that are that that have a, a provenance returned to the communities where they came from. Um, the, in the in the small scale seed movement, we talk about this as rematriation. rematriation. Yep, I read that word. Yeah. I was just going to say that. He so did his homework. That was that was my <laughs> that was going to be my next question. So, um, sorry to cut you off, but um, that's okay. Tell tell us more about the seed rematriation. Is that specifically for indigenous people, or is that just specifically for region where the seeds you know are are native and that's where their home is? That term rematriation, that, as I know, it came out of the indigenous seed movement, um, and the uh, indigenous seed keepers network is a, is the the, the go to resource for information about that, and they're they're working, I know, on some resources for uh, um, best practices for rematriation. I, I, I'll start by saying it's an incredibly complicated, complex process laden with lots of nuance. There are issues of um, of deep historical uh, and contemporary trauma that are uh, w wound up in, in um, doing this kind of intercultural work, uh, in particular in, in uh, talking about rematriation of indigenous seeds. And the, really the, the leaders in this movement are indigenous people themselves doing this work, like uh, folks like Rowan White. And at the same time, Rematriation can be used as a term to apply to uh, returning seeds to to any community where the seeds came from. And there are communities around the world that had seeds taken from them by U.S. plant explorers. That's what they're called, who were sent around the world to collect plants. And typically, without compensating the people they took the plants from, these are the plants that that populate the the U.S. government seed banks around the, around the country. And um, many other countries have similar seed banks themselves. And uh, there are private seed banks and, and collections as well, like Seed Savers Exchange and uh, Arkinoa in, uh, in Switzerland and the Echo Seed Bank in, in Florida. Um, so these are, you know, there are communities around the world that have lost their agricultural heritage, which is a key part of cultural heritage, 
And yet those seeds may be sitting in a vault somewhere uh, or sitting in a, in a freezer somewhere. Um, so there is, uh, the, there is a, a great deal to be done to liberate those seeds from, from their cold, dark holes and return them to the hands and hearts of the people who, uh, who they really belong with. And, you know, that there are surely communities, uh, non-Indigenous communities in, in this co uh, continent as well that, that have been alienated from their agricultural history. Uh, and many of those seeds may still be available. We've done work with, uh, with seeds from Syria and um, managed to return some seeds to Syrian refugees at a refugee camp in Lebanon. Um, we're working with um, South Sudanese seeds and, and we hope to someday be able to return some seeds to South Sudanese communities uh, who are currently displaced by, uh, by a civil war there. And uh, we are uh, fiscal sponsors, the Experimental Farm Network is, of the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library which works to preserve seeds, um, seeds from, from Palestine. It's uh, run by a Palestinian woman named Vivian Sansor, who has become a great friend of mine. And uh, uh, our relationship started when I, uh, when I reached out and said, hey, I have, some, I have some seeds that I got from the US government that, uh, that one in particular was a wheat from Gaza that we would like to uh, return. That was just the beginning of, uh, of the process. And it's continued for years, and and it's been uh, incredibly meaningful for me, and uh, and I, I believe for her as well. That that's a tough subject. There is a lot to unpack there. Yeah. There's a lot of, like you said, history that goes back with it and brings it into contemporary times as well. I think you called it a contemporary trauma. That there's a lot there, but I think it drives it down to its simplest form, where everybody needs food, and they're, I guess, we come from civilizations that used to get their food from a local area. I, I, th I think it's pretty new where we're transporting food in, but it brings it back to the time where the nutrition that we grow for ourselves becomes part of the culture. And so I guess it is like, it, it, it is returning the seeds back to their culture and their cultural home. And we've had this conversation on the podcast before about the role of white people in permaculture uh, and the complexity that goes with that movement as a whole that I think is, I, I'm really happy as somebody that's farmed for a number of years now that this conversation is coming forward. And I feel like it's only been in the last couple of years that permaculture has really started to grapple with this conversation. There's no easy answer. And that's, that's okay. It's okay to not be an easy thing to have an answer to. Uh, that means it's worth getting to that answer. But you know, as long as we have those conversations, we're on that, we're going in the right direction. And uh, that's the first step is uh, self-determination to the communities that has been stripped from. Yeah, I think it, this comes down, to, or one of the things that this is kind of pointing to is this idea of ownership of plants because of its role in our community and our culture and all of these different components, how food is very much a part of who we are and our, our identity. So I do want to ask to kind of pivot from that a little bit. You had mentioned out of this idea of like intellectual property in terms of seeds. What do you think the the end game really is for something like this, uh, where people can literally own genetic information. And I'm curious as to how that plays into things like climate change and the future where uh, peak oil and petrochemicals don't really exist anymore, but the soil has been decimated. And again, a very light question for you. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think that Personally, I'm I'm deeply, deeply opposed to plant intellectual property in, in general. Um, I don't think anybody should be able to own life. I think it's a it's a really slippery slope and a really dangerous thing. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, yeah, really, really strongly opposed to that. Um, we're we're partner organization with the Open Source Seed Initiative or OSSI, which OSSI is. Um, is an effort to detach uh, traditional intellectual property from, from seeds. And people who have seeds that they did put work into breeding can put a, they put the, what's called the open source pledge, the Aussie pledge on their seeds. And then when those seeds are distributed, they carry that pledge with them. Um, and it says these seeds will never be, uh, will never be patented. It has more complicated language, but I think you can find it in OSS. E-E-D-S.org, O-S-C, 
and that is uh, that's a really cool organization and just one effort that's working on combating this. But really, this is something that activists and um, uh, policymakers are going to have to work on together to strip from from our laws. There's there's really no you know there's no excuse at this point for uh, for not understanding that that patents uh, can be misused. Uh, they shouldn't apply. There's at the very least, even even someone like Tom Vilsack, uh, who I'm, I'm not a big fan of, our new uh, new and former uh, Secretary of Agriculture, has said apparently that he thinks um, the term of plant patent should be reduced to five years to uh, encourage more competition. But it's I, I think it's time to get rid of these things. And when you actually think about um, genetically modified food genetically modified organisms that, that people grow for plant uh, for food so many of these things really are are not uh, are, are not necessary from an agronomic perspective farmers can grow plenty of food without them and you can just see from the explosion of organic and non-gmo food that it's possible people are doing it and they're making more money than traditional farmers while they're doing it uh, than conventional farmers and um, you know the real reason why these things exist is because they are patentable in a way that open pollinated seeds are not. And so, you know, companies see this as an opportunity to make money. And now things with, with um, uh, things are starting to change with uh, CRISPR gene editing technology there. There's it's, it's a real slippery slope and, you know, I'm not a Luddite. I don't, I don't disbelieve in, in technology. And I, I, I recognize that, um, you know, Tinkering with uh, with genomes is not in, an inherently evil act. I don't believe it is, but I don't believe that these things should be out in the environment where they can affect my ability to make a living as a grower of organic seeds, for one, and where they can uh, where they can cross with wild plants and and end up in wild populations. This is this is dangerous, and we need to change the law so that genetically modified organisms have to stay in controlled environments where they can't get out into the wider environment. If a bee can fly from someone's genetically modified zucchini to the traditional squash that I've, that I'm growing, that I've been, you know, that has been maintained for hundreds of years as a particular variety in one year from the flight of one bee, they can ruin everything. And that's, uh, that's really sad. And, um, you know, I think, I think we need to, we need to address that from a policy perspective as to how this relates to to climate change and and the, the some of these broader questions it's because of the monopolization of a few corporations the way they have reduced biodiversity and forced farmers through economics into buying their seeds year after year after year and buying ever bigger uh, tractors and combines year after year this is how farming has become such a big driver of, of climate change. Um, and, uh, you know, if we return to a more localized system, if, uh, if we remove seeds uh, as something that can be patented and really return the vast majority of seeds to the commons, I, I, think, uh, I think we're going to be able to have a much more sustainable agriculture system. But I do want to add, uh, uh, now that I, I use that word in this context, that Again, in, in considering the relationship that Native American people have with seeds, it's important to realize that, you know, being a white person and saying that all seeds should be in the commons is, uh, is a way of, um, of marginalizing and, uh, and diminishing and, and um, uh, not understanding indigenous attitudes to seed. And um, so for people who, for whom seeds are sacred, um, the whom seeds may be considered like a relative or ancestry. Yeah. The ancestors, these are not something that can be claimed by anyone as part of, as part of the commons. These are something that, um, that, that have a particular identity associated with a particular people. And, and those people have, um, I believe, and, and they believe have the, to, uh, to determine what happens with those seeds and uh, and and what they're used for? So this, you know, even this concept of the commons as it applies to seeds is is um, is a pretty complicated one, and it's something that uh, that deserves much more uh, thought and attention and discussion. Yeah, absolutely. 
So one of the things that I am always kind of trying to wrap my head around and something we've talked about in the past, there's a lot of foods that have been lost and a lot of, um, like you said, plants that either haven't been discovered as a food resource or maybe they are, but they haven't been fully utilized. Um, is there a specific plant that you in particular are like, we should be doing more with this and it, it has uh, a bright future in the the future of food? Oh, I mean, there are, there are really countless plants like that. Um, and I, I think that, um, you know, I, I would struggle to name just one, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about all sorts of plants that, I mean, you mentioned sorghum in the beginning. Sorghum is a plant that is actually one of the most widely grown grains in this country, but it's, it's primarily grown as animal feed. And people are starting to eat it more now because it's a gluten-free grain and it's, uh, it's, it's useful in both in gluten-free flour mixes and, and as, a, as a standalone grain or a f- grain for flour for, for gluten-free baked goods. It makes a decent beer. And it makes a decent beer, absolutely. Uh, it actually makes the most, the most widely consumed liquor in the world is, is uh, made from um, distilled fermented sorghum. And that's called, that's uh, baiju in, in China. But it's something that, uh, it's something that uh, requires much less inputs than corn. Uh, it requires less water than corn. It can be grown on more marginal land. And it's, you know, it, it, nutritionally, it's, it's incredibly valuable. It, it, can, it can withstand a drought. It's, it's just a, a wonderful crop. Uh, some varieties, you can get a grain crop from the seed head, and then you can press the stalks and get a sugar crop uh, and, and make sorghum molasses. So that's, that's one. I'm, I'm excited about some crops that are not really, uh, not really widely grown anymore. There's a, a species of buckwheat called tartary buckwheat that I'm pretty excited about these days. I've got some of that. Oh yeah. All right. Tartary buckwheat is wonderful. And it's, um, it's got more antioxidants. It's healthier than, than your traditional buckwheat. Uh, it's loaded with rutin, quercetin. It's, it's, um, and it's delicious. I, I got some flour here and uh, I did a trial a few years ago of uh, about 80 different, uh, different types, uh, mostly from the U S government collections. And it's, it's still popular in, in parts of East Asia and the Himalayas, but it's not in this country, it's a very regional thing. It's pretty much grown in Acadia, in, in northern Maine. It's grown in Quebec, um, but it used to be grown in Pennsylvania and in uh, West Virginia and Maryland and New York State. And it's just uh, it, it's just become a very hyper local thing that that is poised to uh, to expand. Um, you know, even things things like acorns that require uh, some processing to turn into food. People, you can buy acorn flour if you go to a Korean market, um, but you can't buy acorn flour at most markets here, even though our woods are full of them. You know, there's there's so many things like that that could be a much more sustainable part of our diet uh, that that just aren't yet. But uh, you know, people are people are playing around with these things. Uh, there's a there's a guy named Little John in Wisconsin who sells um, different Little John uh, <laughs> presses acorns for. Um, for oil, red oak. Oh, I've seen that actually. And it's delicious. Um, and you know, there's, there's just, uh, there, there's so many, so many possibilities out there. We just need more people experimenting with them, playing around with them and, and popularizing them. But I think we will get to a point where, and it's happening already there that some of these hyper local foods, uh, become popular again. That actually brings me to my next question, where you had mentioned earlier with relocalizing your uh, our, our food systems and having people, you know, prepare foods for the winter and learning to can or make jams again. How do, should people, if they're interested in this and they want to grow new foods, how do they go from you know growing the new food to harvesting it and using it for those multiple purposes? Do is it all experimentation or is there a resource that you go to or is it all word of mouth where you find people who have experimented with these ingredients and know how to make things out of it? Um, that's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different ways. Yes, um, some experimentation is usually required, but the Internet has got so many amazing resources for this. And there are there are, there are books out there. But one uh, one resource that I, that. It has become really popular and that that I really like is called Plants for a Future. 
It's a, it's a website run out of the UK. It's pfaf.org, I believe. And they, they have, I think, thousands of plants in their, in their system. And they sort of, uh, it's a sort of very simple, des simply designed website that shows you pictures up at the top and scientific names and common names and tells you uh, has, has a sort of a five leaf uh, system and a five heart system for medicinal plants. You know, something that is very medicinal has five hearts. If it's slightly medicinal, might have one. Same with the edibility. And then there's, it, it explains down at the bottom which parts of the plant are eaten, uh, lists possible dangers associated with the plant. And that's uh, that's a really cool resource. It's it's become, I think, a globally useful resource because it's not just plants in the UK that they talk about. Then there's, you know, there's folks like Eric Tonesmeyer, who I mentioned earlier, who gave that talk that inspired the, this, the, the Experimental Farm Network in the beginning. He's got some great books on perennial vegetables. A guy named Stephen Barstow has a, a book um, on perennial vegetables. And then, you know, if you're, uh, if you're adept at using the internet, there are, you can find these scholarly papers um, about ethnobotanical uses of particular plants in very, very localized places. I get, I get these emailed updates now from, uh, I think it's called academy, academia.org or something. I get so many of those. <laughs> yeah, it sends me these things. And, you know, I just got one that was about traditional uses of ethnobotanical wild crops in Azerbaijan. And I was like, oh, this is great. I've been, I'm trying to figure out some stuff about Azerbaijan. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there, there are, there are lots and lots of resources out there. It just, uh, it just takes looking. Awesome. Yeah, because I mean, Andy, I think before we started this, you we were talking about you were going to get your hands on some honey locust pod. Yeah. And we talked about the honey locust pod, but I'm thinking like, what the hell are you going to do with it? Like, what, you know what I mean? Like, what? yeah, my buddy, um, I, we just talked about him before the podcast who lives in North Carolina uh, that has your rhubarb. He's got some Hershey honey locust from Downington Farm, Downingtown Farm, as you informed me. Um, sorry, we're from New England. Everything ends in ton. <laughs> <laughs> he's got some uh, Hershey honey locusts he's sending up to me, and I I'm looking to utilize them for their sugar content. And that, I guess, I leads me into my question about you're in New Jersey. Have you been to Downington Farm, Downingtown Farm? I've been to Downingtown. I don't, I don't know if what they refer to it as Downingtown Farm, but basically, it was John Hershey's nursery. This place was a uh, hundred years ago was the place to go for um, uh, especially nut trees, uh, but really all sorts of uh, tree crops. And uh, I have been there a couple times uh, with some of these guys who are doing a really amazing job of cataloging what's left. It's, uh, it's basically the suburbs now, and there's suburban development all throughout what used to be this beautiful nursery. But if you know what you're looking for, you can find these grafted trees that are four feet wide and dump a huge amount of hickory nuts and um, hybrid hickory pecans and chestnuts and uh, honey locusts and, and all of these amazing things. And there may still be some trees that they haven't even found yet growing in, the, in that area. There are, uh, th these are some, some modern day plant explorers doing really amazing work. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, places like that, I think that haven't even been, been noted or, or studied uh, you know, there's there's historical plantings of trees on farms and houses all over the all over the country that are that have yet to be cataloged. There's my friend Eliza Greenman does uh, some great work. She's looking for uh, mulberry trees and, and also all kinds of nut trees and fruit trees. Um, and she's been uh, she's had a lot of luck at uh, at Quaker meetings. Um, a lot of these you know are buildings where the trees have been maintained and buildings have been there for 300 years in some cases so there there's some amazing resources out there and uh some of these some of these these plants the genetic heritage has to be preserved or or it'll be gone forever yeah it's amazing what's out there and you don't even know about it i'm sure a lot of people that live in those suburbs aren't even aware of what's around them and how rare some of it is and yeah. um, it, it's quite literally living history uh and a testament to what the world could look like it's just it's really cool i'm a i'm a huge um tree guy so like i love all the very obscure edible trees and um so like i've got some of those hick hands that i'm growing uh myself and 
uh, it's just it's so cool that uh, that stuff's out there and it, you end you end up going into this like little world that there's like 12 other people care about it <laughs> and yeah. uh, it, it's everyone's super supportive because I think we all even if you're not on the left or whatever everyone knows kind of the end game that this is something we need to do for everyone not just ourselves. Yeah, I'm um, I'm a big fan of chinkapin chestnuts, which are these smaller native chestnuts, sweeter than the standard American chestnut, and uh, they're also less susceptible to the blight. So um, there are some stands of chinkapins around that produce for years and years and years before the plants die down to the ground, and then they'll send up a shoot again and produce trees. Uh, these uh, these things can live for hundreds of years despite the blight. And uh, they're really, really delicious. But, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find a chinkapin for sale anywhere. Yeah. Um, a chinkapin nut for sale anywhere. Um, there's very few, very few sources for them, even as uh, as seeds for people who want to grow them. Um, but that's uh, that's what I'm really excited about. Yeah, I've been looking for those for a while, but no luck. Edible Landscaping <laughs> in Virginia, I think used to have them, but I haven't seen them in years on their website. Um, you want to check Route Nine Cooperative in Ohio. They have uh, they they may they probably don't have any now. Uh, it's too late. But if you get them in the fall, they often have chinkapin seeds for sale. Uh, Sheffield's in New York State has some for sale sometimes as well. Cutting that out of the episode. No one needs to know <laughs> That's about that. Personal info. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask, um, I, we're kind of digging in deep on stuff that a lot of people listening probably aren't familiar with. So we have a lot of people that are first time gardeners. What would your advice be for somebody that thinks like this is super overwhelming, especially when you're like, we're talking about all the things we're talking about, and we haven't talked about cover crops or a lot of pests or any of these other things. Like what would be your advice for those people? Just grow what you like talk to people who know who do grow in your area who have experience and find out what they like to grow find out what grows well in your area and just try it and don't try one thing but try a bunch of things and expect that you're going to fail but just be comfortable with that failure because if you don't try you're, you're there's no chance you're going to succeed so try as much as you can and uh don't sweat it if you kill something you'll try it again and um seeds are abundant they're around so don't worry if you kill a few of them. Great. I kill things every year. <laughs> <laughs> so for folks that think what you're doing is really cool and want to support what you're doing, where would you recommend them to go to help support you? Um, well, for one, if they're interested in getting seeds from us, they can check out efnseeds.com. If they want to join a breeding project and uh, or, or any other of the participatory research projects on our site, they can go to experimentalfarmnetwork.org. And um, for folks who have resources to share for gardening, if you want to be a mentor in your community, if you have seeds you want to share, land you want to share, tools or equipment, go to coopgardens.org, C-O-O-P gardens.org, uh, and put yourself on the resource sharing map there. Um, if you want to be a source for seeds in your community, we have a we have a sign up button on that site to become a seed hub. We're still accepting applications for folks who want to be a seed hub in their community. Last year, we had 257 seed hubs in 41 states. And we think we that through those seed hubs, we got seeds to about 12,000 gardens. And we're trying to get seeds to even more this year. Um, so, yeah, check out coopgardens.org. We could use help there with uh, donations and uh, with organizers as well if you're if you're somebody who doesn't mind being on some zoom calls and and talking things out we we do our best to make our decisions through consensus and we're uh yeah we're all volunteers just uh trying to uh help increase local food production during this uh during this crisis and uh which is just one more on top of uh many many crises in our uh in our society that are that existed before the pandemic and are are going to exist um long after it as well great so I, I think that's everything for me. You got anything else, Elliot? Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions that I didn't really get to. Um, we didn't get there in the... Well, I feel like I missed my opportunity, so I'm just going to ask them now. Um, sure. So throughout this conversation, we've talked about genetics a lot of these plants. And from what I know about genetics is basically variety seems to be the seasoning that makes life interesting and makes you know new variation possible. 
Um, so with this project that you've started, would you say that's the main point is to get as much variety out there in order to um, d diversify our, our food system and also what's available to us as far as choice goes for food? Um, for sure. I think variety, you know, diversity in food is just, it's beautiful. It's what makes life worth living. I, I would, uh, you know, if there was only one kind of apple and one kind of tomato, and one kind of potato, everything would be so boring and it would be dangerous because one, uh, one, you know, like the potato famine, one fungus could sweep through and kill it all. So, um, we, we need not just experimental farm network. We need more seed companies. And there are, there are, there's such room right now in, um, in, in this country for more people to get into the seed business. Um, seed companies are still this year, a year after the, the pandemic, are again shutting down their websites or only accepting orders two days a week or only accepting orders from commercial customers. It's the capacity is just not there uh, to meet the demand. So, you know, if you have any inclination in this direction, think about growing seeds, reach out to the seed companies in your region or national seed companies and say, hey, I want to be a grower for you. I know what I'm doing. And uh, I have this variety that you don't have in your catalog. And let's go. You know, folks can reach out to us and do that. And and we're uh, we're happy. We've got 35, more than 35 people now growing seeds for us. And a lot of those are people who came to us and said, hey, I have this cool thing. And we were like, great, we'll start selling it. And, uh, you know, there's just, um, there's, there are so many wonderful small scale seed companies cropping up right now. There's a, there's a real renaissance in this, uh, in this movement, but there are huge gaps regionally. There are places in the country that are just not served by a local seed company right now. And, and there's, there's so much room for that. So, and that's one of the reasons why we've originally, we were really focused on seeds from our area, but then Dusty moved to Minnesota and uh, I'm, I'm in Southern New Jersey outside of Philadelphia. And so we have a lot of regional seeds from these areas, but then we started getting growers from other parts of the country and realizing, well, Hey, we, you know, we should be selling seeds from, from, from everywhere. We always list where the seed comes from, who the grower is, where they're growing it. So that people know if it's, you know, if it's likely to be regionally adapted to their area, but then moving these regionally adapted things to other areas also increases diversity. The variety, right? Yeah. You grow something that um, was adapted for the high desert in Utah and you start growing that in South Jersey, the plant's going to behave differently. And you're going to be, you know, three or four generations of selection, you're going to have a different plant than you started out with. And so we just, you know, we want more and more people to do that, um, to start getting more seeds from, from the government collection and getting them out there to people. It's, uh, yeah, there's room for that. You, you said you can get them from, this, from the government. What does that mean? Like, what does that entail for somebody that doesn't have any knowledge of that? It, it's actually not lots of paperwork, believe it or not. It's, um, it's really a short form online, and that's it. Um, it's called the National Plant Germplasm System, or NPGS. The website is www.ars-grin.gov. Ars Grin. The Ars is Agricultural Research Service, and the Grin is the Germplasm Resources Information Network. It just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are, they, they are not going to sell seed. They're not going to give seeds and this is all free. They won't give seeds to folks who they think are just going to be growing them in a home garden. They want to send seeds to someone who has what they consider a legitimate research breeding or educational purpose. So you have to write a paragraph explaining what your use is. If you have an organization name that you can attach to your request, you have a much better chance of, uh, getting those seeds. I've done a couple of talks recently on this subject. There was one I did about a year ago at the Organic Seed Growers Conference that I think is on YouTube. The website has been changed. So I've, I've done it more recently with, at the Northeast Organic Seed Conference this January um, and just did another one during the Culinary Breeding Network's um, showcase. And that is, um, yeah, it, it goes through some of the process. You know, it's, these are precious resources. So you know, they're not to be, they really should not be grown for, you know, one year. And then you're going to, you're not going to save the seeds yourselves. 
these are these seeds are meant to be grown and shared and worked with, uh, used for breeding projects or selection to uh, have them have, play a role in our food system, and not just food, but medicine, fiber, dye plants, uh, industrial crops, all, all sorts of other things that uh, useful plants that are out there. So uh, that actually brings me, I think, to my last question: is uh, if somebody is listening to this and they're like. It's something I've always wanted to do, but now I'm kind of motivated. Like, what kind of space do you need, like, to grow the plants or anything Uh, We started our seed company operating, uh, growing on about an acre, acre and a half. You know, you can, and and that was with a lot of unutilized space. You can really, uh, out of a large garden, you can be growing seeds as long as you're isolated from your neighbors or you're growing species that you know your neighbors aren't growing. Um, you, You can get into it if you have a local farm that has some extra land and you can convince them to let you grow some things in the corner somewhere, do that. We've been farming on somebody else's land for the last eight years. And, uh, you know, there's that, um, we are where we are because they've been generous enough to, to let us use that land for free. We're still on, uh, we've, we've expanded down the field a little bit, but it's still less than two acres. Dusty grows in, in, uh, Minnesota as well. They're, but they're only growing seed on, on an acre or so. Um, maybe a bit more. And uh, many of our growers are growing in, uh, in, in, you know, small farms or even in uh, suburban housing. We have farm, farmers who grow in urban uh, situations and, and can produce seeds there for us. And it's uh, a lot of plants. Like I said, seeds are abundant and you can grow a lot of seeds from a small amount of space. Um, there's some great books out there. Suzanne Ashworth, Seed to Seed is a great book about, about growing seeds. Um, there's just a, a, a number of great seed resources out there. Seed Savers Exchange has wonderful resources online for how to learn how to um, how to save seeds. And, you know, it's, it's important to know what you're doing so that you're not selling seeds or distributing seeds that are all crossed up and are not what you say they are. But it's not something that you can't learn. Great. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I think we pretty well covered it. I, I could talk all night, as you imagine, but uh, <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Me too. It's a dangerous game. Yeah, with you two guys, yeah. I feel totally I, out of my league here. I, I've never, I think the last plant that I grew was in a red solo cup and it sprouted and I planted <laughs> it outside and it, it died. So I, I we're going to work on that may, this year. Maybe I'm going to get some seeds, uh, get them to germinate. I don't even know if I can do that. I'm confident in you. We're going to work on that. I have no faith. No but, faith. Well, right. Nate, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to have you on. It was very nice to meet you. I, I would say good luck to you in the future, but you guys are absolutely crushing hey, it, and I don't you. think you'll need it. So, Thanks yeah, so much. Thank you so much. As always, if you enjoyed this episode and this interview, please give us a review on iTunes, which heavily impacts our outreach to new listeners and helps to continue bringing on new and exciting guests. We appreciate your support. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for joining us on the Poor Pearls Almanac. This is Andy. This is Elliot. Later, nerds.